Hi, my name is Raquel and ordered fire cell. You have to have the money, the beast, on your mind or in your hand. One of those words they don't translate correctly. Well, we've had, it's, it's Valentine's Day today and also it's a full moon. And you can see that the, whoops, is this, that's not the right one. This one is that um, in order to buy or sell, you have to have the money, karagma of the beast, on your mind or in your hand. And the Greek-English lexicon shows you that the karagma means the impress on the coin or stamp money coin, but they don't tell you the truth about that. There's a lot of things that they're hiding from us. And one of these scariest things I've read in a long time, it's about global warming. It's called the coming instant planetary emergency. And they're talking about like planetary ex like extinction because of um, global warming and like the Arctic ice is melting off and it's um, if the ice isn't reflecting the sun then it's going to cause um, more oceans to warm up and in the Arctic they have all this methane like in the peat moss and there's methane under the water too that's frozen and like if this stuff gets released into the atmosphere it will just like shoot up the um, carbon dioxide in the air and the temperature will rise like four to six degrees centigrade and it's going to cause um, uh, the temperatures to rise and um, and then the waters to rise but um, if the temperatures rise then it's going to like cause different rain patterns and like California right now is having you know like a 500 year drought they say even if it rains every day for like 45 days it's still they're still going to be in a drought down there and like they were saying something like 60 percent of our vegetables come from there vegetables and fruits and nuts and things so I mean that I mean we go through like El Centro and you can see all the food they grow in that valley which is all fed by the Colorado River and um, the Imperial Valley in California there and so well you know there's they could get rid of horses. There's so many horses. But anyway, I'm talking about this drought thing in this um, article that I got over here. And there, um, there's a professor here at the University of Arizona named McPherson. And they, they call him like, what the heck is it, like Doomsday McPherson. I'll get to it in a minute here. But the artic this article was written in December 17th of last year. And... Um, it, it just scares me so much because they're saying, you know, like, if the atmosphere in the Arctic it releases all this methane, it's going to cause the the um, heat to rise, and you know, it's going to melt waters. They're talking about extinction. I mean, this is just like incredible. The stuff they're saying about this, and this was originally published in the Nation magazine. Uh, but like you know, I just kept thinking about it today. These are scientists, and you know they're thinking that their children are gonna have a real hell of a time. You know, this is a major extinction. The last time they had this much carbon dioxide in the air was when this volcano erupted, and back like 300 million years ago, 250 million years ago, and 95% um, of all species were wiped out. If this um, and he's saying a lot of people are going to die off if the temperatures rise six degrees because the plants won't, you know, the, they won't be able to handle that. They might be able to get one crop of wheat in maybe if they're lucky and if the rain pattern hasn't changed. But instead of getting like two crops, I mean, America is pretty kind of safe. Maybe they could, you know, they grow a lot of grain up in Canada and a lot of that grain is fed to cows, you know, that corn they grow up there. And the soybeans is pressed for oil. And that toys, corn and soybeans is a very nutritious mixture. It, it has all the necessary amino acids. And so, like, if, you know, it got really bad and you lived around Iowa or Chicago even, you could get out into the country where they have those grain silos. And I don't know how they would work if the um, electricity didn't work. You know, some of those grain silos are like fiberglass and they're pressurized and temperature controlled and all that you know so like if the corn you know the corn will last long enough and then next year you could plan something you know like 
if you can get the electricity working. I mean, this this is really serious with this global warming, and it's just like it's like if in Tucson here. It's it was like eighty five degrees today, and um, and so we're expecting like record heat tomorrow. And like I was, I was telling you earlier, like California is in a really serious drought where they grow all the food uh, because the Sierra Mountains there don't have much snow. They've only got like 20% of the snow they usually get. But we're here dependent on that Colorado River, which, you know, isn't doing that much better either. The Nevada has had to dig like a $2 billion tube and to get the lower water since the and if the water goes down too much, then there won't be any uh, um, power generated from Lake Mead there, the Hoover Dam, and up in Page, Arizona. I think they got the Parker Dam or something like that up there. And um, but like I think the Northwest, and they even say in here that you know if it gets really bad, the best place to be would be like in the Arctic, you know, Alaska. They even talk about that in this article. This guy, Fearson, his name is Guy McPherson, and he teaches at the University of Arizona. He's a climate expert. You know, he's he's been studying this so long. And there's a few of these people out there. You know, that that's and but and but not only that, NASA is even. You know, they're they're starting to come out with this. And just recently, there's been a study in Nature magazine that suggested a 50 gigaton burp of methane coming from thawing Arctic permafrost around the Siberian Sea could erupt in any time, releasing 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide. And if it did that, that would be like four times the amount of carbon dioxide that we released since the, um, what is it, say the Industrial Revolution. So, I mean, you know, we're talking about, like, a serious event that could just happen like this, you know, and I, I think, you know, I think we've passed the point of no return. And this guy, some of these scientists say this, too, here. This is why this is so scary, that, um, you know, it's kind of like we're on the Titanic right now, and, like, there's no pilot, or the pilot's drunk, you know, like it says in the Book of Revelations that these... Um, Plutocrats will stand afar off, and and uh, because they drank from the wrath of it's all crazy stuff. You know, the revelation was like talking about Babylon falling. You know, Babylon is a city of commerce and confusion. They had a whole bunch of different languages there. I think that's where, according to the mythology, that God uh, stirred up their tongues so they couldn't speak to one another. Yeah. It's a very you know the mythology in the Bible is. It's pretty pretty good, you know. I, I don't know of any others that are much better, you know. It's like, but you could, you know, boil this down pretty quick. You know, the Old Testament has, you can, you know, have probably a Cliff Notes version of the Bible to give you the main philosophical points in the Old Testament. A lot of it is just, you know, silly words and psalms and proverbs and things like that. But, um, so the New Testament... The problem with that is this guy, St. Paul, who, like, screwed everything all up, he didn't quite understand what the message of Jesus Christ was. And Jesus was a revolutionary, a radical. You know, he upset the tables of the money changers, and he told his disciples that they can't carry uh, money. He tells them not to carry money. And I have that in my Gospel of Eliminating Money. If you go to my website, I've got a bunch of fit quotations from famous people who believed in eliminating money. Well, I've got a little version of it right here. And so, like, this in this article I've been telling you about, where they're talking about global warming, there, this guy McPherson says that, you know, they're not going to change because um, McPherson does not hold much hope for the future, he says. There's not much money in the end of civilization. You know, like, People like me are, are the prophets, you know, they're, they're signs of the times. You know, these guys are seeing them. They, they see methane bubbling up in the ocean. People, the scientists have seen this, and they, they can measure it. And these people are like voices in the wilderness. And he even mentions the news media in here. He says, I am 40, this is the author who wrote this, I am 45 years old, 
and um, you know he's worried about his kids. You know he's concerned about that. But where is this about the newspapers? There's well, he says McPherson, who teaches at the University of Arizona here, says that there's not much money in the end of civilization, and even less to be made in human extinction. So I mean, you know, there's no profit in in doom and gloom. You know, you gotta keep consuming. You know, we're on the Titanic or musical chairs, and these plutocrats, they all have their jets and yachts they can use to escape to um, wherever the climate is good, maybe maybe Alaska, like, um, but then, you know, I'm wondering what it'll be like in the winter, you know, I mean, are these people going to jet back down to Antarctica, or, or maybe there's a good place, like, maybe in New Zealand, you know, the south end of New Zealand will probably be really nice, I mean, that's really beautiful down there. Um, and so th then he says, the destruction of the planet, on the other hand, is a good bet because there's no money in this. As long as that's the case, it's going to continue. Oh, yeah, there, no, he's saying there is money. There's money in uh, the destruction of the planet. You know, I mean, it's, it, there's money in burning fossil fuels, I mean, selling us all this stuff. And, you know, I mean, like, you know, the question is, you know, I mean, this guy's saying you just can't really give up. You know, you, you either got, especially if you have children, you know, how can you just, you know, you, you, so some, there are some people that are waking up to the seriousness of this. And I think I've been saying this, you know, for a while, you know, I kept thinking that, oh, peak oil is going to get us. But the way this looks, you know, I mean, they're coming out with more and more evidence. And you can see how crazy this weather is. It's like, um, like I'm saying, it's been really warm down here, and they've had a lot of snowfall in the upper eastern part of the United States there on the east coast, and that um, it's it's unusual. You know, the, they had Hurricane Sandy. They had a lot of hurricanes. Last year we didn't have that many, but whatever we've been having, it's been getting worse. You know, the tornadoes, and this isn't signs from God or anything. It's just it's signs from burning up the fossil fuels. And and now they're saying, like I was telling you, that you know and they've known about this all this methane in the peat moss up there in the Arctic. It's going to um, start uh, releasing all this methane, and that's gonna that's even worse. It's much worse than carbon monoxide is carbon dioxide. And so uh, you know, I mean, it could just happen like that. And already we've lost like 40 percent of the phytoplankton and that feed all the fish in the wa in the water. And so, you know, it's like if the upper all ice melts, you know, even um, NASA and uh, I think the Navy have done studies, you know, they're concerned about what's going to happen in the Arctic for getting boats through and things. And they, they're they saying that the Arctic ice could melt totally just by in 2018, in a couple of years, it could be the first time ever like in maybe 30,000 years or so, they talk about it in here, that, you know, when the last time the North Arctic ice all melted. I don't know how they can tell, maybe, I don't know, but I guess they can tell when, oh, probably by looking at the ice on Greenland, maybe 36,000 years ago, a lot of the <clears throat> ice melted off Greenland, so by figuring it out, they can tell that. Well, that ice melted up there a few years ago. I can't find it in here. But, I mean, this is one of the scariest articles I've ever read. And I've got it up on my Facebook page. I just put it up the other day. I found out about this because they had a show on TV, uh, or not on TV. They had a show on, um, oh, what is that? Live, live, you know, that, oh, on the internet, it's a live stream, that's what it is, and this guy was talking about the Kennedy assassination. I found out about it because I'm friends with um, Jesse Ventura on Facebook, and you know, some of the stuff he does is pretty good, you know, not, some of it is, he's just, I don't know, some of it's kind of wacko, but, you know, he, so anyway, he was announcing that this man named John Barber, Barbour, or I don't know how to pronounce it, but you can look here and see for yourself, he was on the, uh, he's a very good movie producer, and he made this, I don't know why he doesn't put it up on the internet, but I'm going to maybe ask him, but next time I get back here, 
I'll um, find out whether he's got this on the, uh, or if I can put it up there. But he had an article in the uh, in the Los Angeles Times about this uh, about this movie he made. Oh, I can't get it to work. So anyway, I watched this movie on the internet, and then they had I think it was Jim Mars, and um, and it was all about Jim Garrison, the the man who um, did an investigation on the and the assassination of JFK, and um, he. Um, was the star of Jim Garrison or of um, Oliver Stone's movie about um, killing Kennedy here? And he says the CIA, he, Jim Garrison, he is a district attorney for uh, for the New Orleans, and he later became a federal judge, appellate court judge. But uh, yeah, they were really getting at, down after these guys, and they were. You know, they couldn't bring up the truth about this either because it would create a lot of disillusionment. They, they arrested these tramps out behind the grassy knoll, and right around Watergate time, some guy noticed what they looked pretty much similar between these um, pictures of E. Howard Hunt and there's Frank Sturgis. So, like, they've had a couple congressional committees to look into these pictures and they kind of whitewashed it you know the and then Rockefeller um, had a commission in 1975 that Ronald Reagan was serving on too the Rockefeller commission and just you know it was like the Warren commission and they looked into these tramp photos and and kind of whitewashed it and Oliver Stone was aware of these tramp photos let me see yeah he published it in this book here and and they were arrested behind in a gondola car out back of the grassy knoll. You can see him walking through here. Well, the hunt tramp isn't showing. You can see his boots down there. But there's the Sturgis tramp. And then this one they call Frenchy tramp. And uh, I think people know who he is, but at the time I read this book, I, I, don't, I don't really know. But the point is, the, the two tramps I showed you here E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis were really good friends, and they were anti-Castro, so they didn't like Kennedy, and that, that might have a lot to do with the military-industrial complex, because you know Kennedy was against the war in Vietnam. But um, in that movie that I saw, that, that it was unfortunate they raised this issue of the um, uh, so-called greenbacks that Kennedy allegedly allowed with the um, executive order 11110 and you know that was um, not a reason they killed Kennedy a lot you know it's like when you get to these conspiracy theories they there's there's always a little sometimes you know there was a I even heard that what, what the heck is that guy's shirt off I think it's one of these guys that are like a national security agency they had some kind of a memo that that got leaked out and there they tell people to like infiltrate these organizations like the 9-11 thing and um, any kind of a thing the Kennedy assassination and some of them will tell a few things that are really true you know and you know, like if you're not you know if I've been studying this Kennedy assassination for a long time and my criteria for somebody that that is telling the truth well they'll talk about um, about the, the the three tramps, uh, you know, that's really good if they do that. But they'll also talk about the CIA being involved. Well, you can't really talk about, you know, the CIA being involved without mentioning uh, E. Howard Hunt and, and Frank Sturgis. So those are the people. And, you know, that, that, that like I was saying, there's a lot of propaganda, like in the 9-11 stuff, the, this woman says they're Judith, uh, Judy or something like that, the, uh, Judy not Baker, maybe, I don't know, but she's saying that they used some kind of a particle beam to melt this building, but they didn't do that. They used some kind of bomb in there, and a lot of people that were witnesses, they got it on videotape, you know, they, they were interviewing these firemen that were there, and they, and they were sitting down talking, looking at the camera, and the guy goes, yeah, it was just like boom, 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 on each floor, just like a controlled demolition. That's just what this guy said on videotape. And that's what happened. If you look at the um, 
evidence, like after the, I never believed it. That somebody told me that the building just came straight down, which, um, you know, I couldn't believe. And, I, and so when I finally saw it on TV, I was just like, wow, that's the craziest thing I ever saw. And I couldn't explain it. But because um, there, not only that, but there was nothing left. You know, if you look at the ground zero from above, and I've got this on my website, pictures of, you know, a few days after the collapse of the building, there's nothing there. The only thing you see is these big steel girders, but everything else was pulverized. And I've got a few pictures up there. It looks like snow, you know, several inches thick of just like everything that was there, you know, asbestos, uh, concrete, glass. And a lot of the people that were at Ground Zero have horrible cancer now, like mesothemia and stuff like that, and, they, you know, like stuff in their lungs. And, and like, there's pictures of... of like I think maybe the Environmental Protection Agency and those guys have like on um, hazmat suits you know they know better than to be walking around this pile and there's all this smoke coming out and there's even pictures and witnesses some of these same people in these videos are, will tell you that there was just like rivers of molten metal and, and you know they're just telling us like yeah there was you know it's a fact these guys aren't lying these guys are right there in New York City and they saw it with their own eyes and you can tell they're not lying. And, and so, you know, how did jet fuel start a fire that was that hot that it could melt metal, you know? That's ridiculous. And so that, um, but like I was saying, it's, the whole buildings were pulverized. And the only thing left, like, in the ground zero was just, like, these steel girders. And they carted them all off and took them to China and melted them down and made sewers or something out of them, sewer lids, I don't know. But they destroyed the evidence. But like a lot of people saved some of that dust that that was covering all of New York. I, mean, I don't know why, but they did. And so they so or maybe so they analyzed this dust and they found um, like these little spheres of metal in in there, which means there was some kind of a temperature or some kind of chemical reaction. And these physicists have said that, you know, the only way that could have happened was with this, you know, it was just some kind of a new kind of a bomb. And they, they make nanoparticles. They make these so small. And they're saying that, like, only the government could do it, just like this anthrax that they found. I think they've said that it was special anthrax from a U.S. government fort that allegedly um, that was spreading around. And then they falsely accused that guy and... And then some other guy killed himself, and they blamed it on him. So, um, you know, like, uh, I don't know what the heck's going on, you know, like with um, Clinton and Hillary. You know, Hillary is really like a nutcase, you know. And what's with this dynasties kind of stuff? You know, like Bush, there's been two Bushes in there, and, and um, you know, Hillary coming in, we don't, we don't want that. And so, like... Um, We've got to really, I mean, I think that there should be a discussion about this climate change. I hope, well, in these presidential debates, you know, there's, I don't really think there's anything that could be done. And you're not going to expect to hear one of these candidates tell you that, oh, yes, I am going to, um, what are we going to do? You know, what can you do with this, with this climate? I guess I heard that, like, Arizona was going to have some kind of, um, I live in Arizona, if you're watching from out of state. And, and so, like, they um, were going to have some kind of a commission in Arizona to study what would happen if, um, what the heck was it? I thought it was a good idea, but they were kind of trying to make fun of it in the paper. Um, I don't know. I, I think, you know, they should have, like, the National Guard trained. I mean, what, what would you do here in Tucson? Like, I mean, I, if the temperature is this hot now, how hot is it going to be this summer? And we never have the monsoons like we used to which would cool uh, everything off. And, you know, we're having not that bad of a drought here, but you wouldn't know it. It, it is a, they say, uh, you know, we don't get that much rain anyway, but, like, um, we sure do miss, miss those um, summer monsoons. But if the um, water table keeps going down, like, you know, how much longer are they going to be able to grow in California? They're saying, you know, they're, they're going to have to not grow a lot of that stuff. I mean... You can do pretty much live without, like, <clears throat> some of the stuff they grow. <clears throat> but um, especially these dumb 
horses, you know. I read an article, like, in California, they have maybe, I don't know, it's a com- tremendous amount of horses, like maybe maybe 600,000, something like that. It's a lot of horses. So you got to figure each one of them, how much water they drink and, and all the alfalfa and hay and stuff that they use to feed them with, you know. It's like, well, you know, I guess, you know, if things got bad, you could eat the horse. But, um, uh, yeah, this global warming thing really really scared me. And, uh, well, it really scared me when I first found out about this Kennedy assassination, too. Because, you know, I thought the Warren Commission report was the truth. And, you know, it, they published all these nice volumes. And when I first started reading about this, I, I was right here in the University of Arizona. It was kind of a coincidence that I found the book because I was doing research about Pol Pot. Because Pol Pot was one of these people who believed in eliminating money. But um, so I was just, you know, I thought, well, wow, that's a really smart thing to do, you know. And what really happened? I, you know, I wanted to read more about it. You know, I, I've heard that, you know, he killed all these people and stuff like that. But they always demonize everybody when, you know, the establishment doesn't like them. And the, estab- money, the money establishment had a lot of reason to not like Pol Pot just like they don't like Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro is another one of these people who believe in eliminating money. And Muammar Gaddafi believed in eliminating money. I've got, like I said on my website, I've got all these quotes from famous people who believe in eliminating money. Even Karl Marx, you know, he wouldn't know it, but a true communist believes in eliminating money. So I've got quotations from all these people on there, but like um, the all, all these wars are caused for money, and Pol Pot uh, got rid of the money, and he started getting things going again. You know, he, after the war, the Vietnam War, the the U.S. B-52 bombers, they rained down bo- bombs all over the eastern half of uh, Cambodia there because those were the supply routes to South Vietnam. There's a very narrow passage, so... In order to get from the north of Vietnam, they had to go through Cambodia. And the United States just rained tons and tons of bombs. I, I don't know how much, but they actually used those those b- bomb craters for, like, fish ponds now. But the U.S. bombers killed so many people, too. You don't hear about that. You know, they talk about these killing fields. I think the whole thing's propaganda. And Noam Chomsky wrote a book about it. And he doesn't go as far as I do. But, you know, I don't have all that proof. You know, Pol Pot probably did kill a lot of people. I mean, it was a civil war. And, uh, you know, there were probably people that were, you know, I mean, you could just imagine what would happen if there was somebody like me that had more people watching that believed in eliminating money. And, you know, a lot of people were starting to believe in that, you know, like like the early Christians, the Essenes, who were contemporaries of Jesus, they didn't touch any money either. And they didn't. They care, they traveled around in the little hippie communes and stuff like that. And um, I think the greatest hippie commune right now is up in uh, North Korea. And uh, you know, I think that that you know they demonize these people because they're independent. And like, if Pol Pot was allowed to keep going, same like with um, Castro. That's one of the reasons why they didn't let people go from the United States down to see him. You know, during the 60s, it was illegal to go to Cuba. And I think Jerry Rubin, Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman, I don't know if they both went, but one of them did, and they wrote about it in their book. It was Jerry Rubin. He wrote in his book that, that Castro believes in eliminating money, too. And so um, they um, got rid of these people, and they demonized them, and they got rid of Gaddafi and... Uh, stole his oil, they got rid of Saddam Hussein, and, you know, Saddam Hussein was like a socialist. They had, what the heck did they call that kind of socialism? Bath, the Bath Party, B-A-A-T-H, something like that. And they, uh, they were very, they were, I mean, I, I'd really like to know, you know, I haven't seen it or not, but I'd like to know how many people are, you know, I mean, are they cursing us over there now? I mean, it's like, all oh, the heroin, they're, they're growing in, uh, in Afghanistan now and of course you know the CIA and the US government is making a profit out of it and I've got a chart here you know that actor who just recently died the heck was his name McFarlane maybe I don't remember that's the guy that 
McFarland is the the University of Arizona professor. But here's like the how many heroin addicts we had in 2002, and they're saying like 400,000, and then it goes up and down, but it shoots up here, which is right around well the end of 2006. So these were that was like that boom time before the before everything got bad. Well, that wouldn't make sense. I don't know, but anyway, it starts going up to 2007, and I was trying to figure out, you know, what like, like things started getting bad around 2008, but it was bad around 2007 too for a lot of people. So, you know, they wanna. It's just like during the, uh, what the heck was it? You know, the the, the riots in 1968 when they killed Bobby Kennedy, you know, they had to get rid of Bobby Kennedy because he knew that his brother was killed by the CIA. Kennedy wanted to splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces. So they got rid of Bobby because he would have done something about his brother's assassination. And Edward Kennedy was so scared, he knew that if he said anything, they'd get him too. So he he didn't say anything. But um, anyway, the um, heroin, like, they flooded the ghettos after Martin Luther King in 68 and Bobby Kennedy. Well, and so, like, you know, um, Martin Luther King was, like, um, he was, you know, a lot of white people liked him, too, because they saw that he was for social justice. And um, they ha he was getting ready to have a million-man march on Washington or something like that and to demand jobs. or I don't remember, but, you know, they, they wanted to get rid of him because... You know that they, they it's like Malcolm X said that Uncle Sam doesn't eliminate an evil because it's an evil, but only when it threatens his existence, and they ended up getting Malcolm X too like um a lot of these people they they've been like they can hypnotize people, and that's what they did to Saran Saran he was Saran Saran was very susceptible to hypnosis, so they could um they could hypnotize him and brainwash him and tell him things like, you know, Robert Kennedy hates the Palestinians, he wants to give Israel uh, weapons and things like that, which which isn't true. You know, Kennedy was against uh, uh, nuclear energy and, and things like that, and he didn't want anybody else to get the atomic bomb, so I don't think he would have, he wouldn't have been too happy with the state of Israel. <clears throat> and that was a big mistake. You know, I keep thinking that the World War II was a big mistake, too. And Hitler was one of those kind of people that was against this banking system. Hitler, one of the party program planks of the National Socialists were to um, abolish interest. It's in big capital letters. It's something like, um, it was a 25-point program or something like that. And it was um, very prominent. And like Hitler would do barter for um, raw materials and things like that and turn them into finished products and send them back to the third world countries and things like that. So they got rid of him, you know, and what Hitler really wanted to do was to get rid of this Bolshevism, this uh, Jewish communism, he called it, and, you know, Stalin and all that. You know, Karl Marx and Muammar Gaddafi, they both say that you know, we can't really have communism until the production is increased. And I'll show you this. I made this little pamphlet a long time ago, like maybe 1985, when um, Reagan bombed Gaddafi and killed his adopted daughter. And so they say, this is Friedrich Engels in The Principles of Communism. He says that when... Um, all capital and production and exchange are concentrated in the hands of people, you know, that like uh, everything would be government-owned, then private ownership will automatically have ceased to exist. Money will have become superfluous, and production will have so increased, and men will be so much changed that the last forms of the old social relations. So, like, you know, if we could have that kind of an ideal that would uh, show people that, you know, money is like all these people employed with it. It's like, you know, bankers and bookkeepers and these stock brokers, you know, they're making all this money with this funny money stuff and these monopoly games they play on there and the sweat of your labor. There's not that many people that really, 
I had a chart I didn't bring it, but you know it shows like the top hundredth of a percent of the rich people that make like thirty million dollars a year, and it says that most of those people are like in finance and and management, you know, CEOs and things like that. And you know, I mean, it's like you always kind of wonder what a CEO really does. You know, I mean, is it you know, the logistical people in the ideal society would be would would be the i you know the people that we would really need and you know there's very few people that actually do the construction work i think there's only like a million construction workers in the entire united states that build all this stuff and half of them are probably unemployed right now you know so like if we eliminated money we could get rid of all these parasitical jobs that 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 are hoarding all the money and these plutocrats have and so i mean when karl marx wrote all this stuff the civilization russia wasn't really ready to go communist and um and it was i don't really know it was a big mess there and it still is you know like they had this guy he went from moscow to sochi in a car and um it was you know the roads were very primitive there i mean russia is a vast country and um so you know Hitler wanted living space and he called it Lebensraum and they wanted to his intentions were to go into Poland and use that area for like farms and things and part of the national socialist program they gave you like like the land they would give you land that you could grow on and and you wouldn't have to pay them back that much and if you had more children then they would write write off that loan and they'd give you the land it's kind of like homesteading so they were going to homestead over in Poland and and uh you know get the farms really working there instead of the, these peasants and that that's a lot of the problem with um these these so i mean i think you know after the iron curtain went down i mean Poland was part of the iron curtain and and communists and all that stuff and that wasn't good i mean who thought that you know east germany or any of these other places they might have i don't know if they had security or what i don't know if they're much better off now but you know the, back then <clears throat> if hitler would have won you figure that they would not have all these muslims there and i think you know the problem is with the world today is you know these stupid religions there's so many of these dumb religious people that don't believe you know they're they had that bill nye science guy and some other guy that runs this creationist museum have a debate about you know creationism and things like that you know and a lot of people don't believe in global warming and i was telling you you have to pick your conspiracy theories carefully like the best evidence in this um so called holocaust is um forensic you know it's not the so called eyewitness testimony it has to do with the alleged murder weapon you know a forensic examination of these gas chambers and like i found out about this from i was just i never really thought that you know i was looking for quotations from famous people who believed in eliminating money and i just never believed that R- germans could have done these things that 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 they were said they did like i they i looked through the nuremberg files cuz you know when i was messing around with the government documents checking out this kennedy assassination stuff then um i came across these nuremberg files and i thought you know maybe i could find some quotations about money in there or something you know and i happened to see this passage where they're talking about ripping people's stomachs open looking for gold you know like these concentration camp people had gold somehow and they swallowed it or something which is possible but you know i mean i just um i don't know how poor these people were some of the jews were allowed to leave i mean i don't know i don't know it wasn't a good thing they put these people in there and but the war started and they didn't have that much of a choice cuz it's kind of like we did with the japanese here we put them in concentration camps and uh so the whole war you know it was a big mistake and it never should have happened it was caused by these banks it's kind of like eisenhower warned of this military industrial complex so that you know we it's that that's what all wars are caused for for money and so like um you know the hitler didn't like these um 
Jews there. They were peasants, kind of. They weren't productive people, and they weren't assimilating. It's kind of like the Muslims today. I just read an article that was saying that in, in Britain, these Islamic people, they're kind of afraid to go out of their areas, you know, because, you know, they, they're wearing these scarves around, and some young man told this woman, or maybe it was another woman, told this woman, I'm going to string you up by your scarf or something like that. So a lot of these Muslims, they're saying these so-called hate crimes against these Muslims in Britain are going up, you know, maybe, you know, I don't know, but I've heard that the Muslims aren't that good either. They rape a lot of the women and turn them into prostitutes and stuff like that. So the whole thing's getting pretty ugly there. And, like, Hitler never would have allowed, if they would have won, you know, they would have kept all these kind of people out of there, which would have been a good thing because you don't want irrational people there, you know, these Christians that that don't believe in evolution. And, you know, there's a big thing now. Of some of these pastors are talking about these blood-red moons and it's symbolic of Israel and all that stuff. And if And if you don't love Israel, then God won't love you and this kind of stuff, you know. That's how some people are, and there's a lot of politicians that don't believe in global warming, you know, because it's not profitable. It's kind of like smoking cigarettes, which I finally quit. You know, people, they never told us that smoking cigarettes were bad, or, and they kept it lying. They didn't tell the truth. Well, here's a funny story about, um, I was talking about the Bible. They're, they're saying, you know, in Genesis and some of these other books in the New Old Testament, they they say that there were uh, people riding camels, but the camels didn't exist until uh, what was it here? They, they didn't live. They didn't live in the area, you know. So it was kind of. Um, let's see. What does it say here? Abraham. They lived in the second first half of the second millennium. So that and then. Uh, the camels didn't get there until the last third of the 10th century. There it is. So that would be like, what, I don't know, a thousand years later. And so, like, the, um, there were no uh, camels. You know, the Bible is, they, they wrote it, and the, I guess, you know, they didn't realize that, you know, it's kind of silly. You know, it's a big mistake. It would be like, you know, saying they just didn't know their history very well. I mean, it's kind of funny. I, I guess there weren't that many history books back then. You know, that it'd be like saying that there was semi-trailer trucks in the, the Middle Ages. You know, that they didn't. And, and so they, anyway, there's um, a lot of lies. And this the forensics of these gas chambers I was telling you about. It's like they say they killed thousands of people in Auschwitz a day by dumping this this louse disinfestant through a hole in the ceiling. And then some of these so-called eyewitnesses say they just swept it out the doors and uh, then they dragged the people out and they had to carry them up a thing, which doesn't make sense, and then burn them in these crematoria. But the logistics of crem cremating all these thousands of people, it requires a certain amount of calories, kilocalories of fuel like coal or something to, and there's no evidence that they had this amount of coal to do all this, you know, so the the major issue though is why would the Nazis dump this stuff through the ceiling like that, which is very, very dangerous, and what they used that for was to control the lives. They had typhus epidemics at Auschwitz, and up to 300 people a day would die there, so they had to build these crematoria. It takes about an hour to cremate a body. So, like at Auschwitz, they had uh, what was it? I don't remember what how many ovens they had there. Sixty, I think, maybe or forty-five. But you know, you can see that forty-five ovens would take care of three hundred people a day if they had to. But they don't all work at the time. You know, sometimes they were they had to clean them and stuff. So, the logistics is one way to to determine that. These people weren't gassed there. A lot of them died. Like you see those pictures of the people in Belsen, which was in Germany. And after the Russians started coming into Germany, and then a lot of the people in the concentration camps didn't want to get stuck behind that Iron Curtain. And they fled with the Nazis. 
back into Germany and they put them in like Belsen, which was behind the, on this side of the Iron Curtain that finally went down. And so um, a lot of them, you know, there was too many people there and the sanitation broke down. So they had these horrible typhus epidemics. And that's why you see these bulldozers pushing these people into these pits and stuff like that. And uh, so um, that, you know, it's not practical to, to build, burn these people either. One of these eyewitnesses said that they had these, they dug pits and threw the bodies in and then poured gasoline or petrol over them and set it on fire and the flames were just shooting up. This is what some alleged eyewitness said and I think is, I don't remember what his name was, but then they even said they used these buckets and with long curved rods and if you that's you know these eyewitnesses it's the worst kind of evidence You've, the best evidence is forensics and the impracticality of it you know of using louse disinfectant you know the way to do it is and they have these chambers and they've got pictures of them they, they had one at Dachau you know they've got very strong steel doors on them and they used them they were literally gas chambers and they'd pile, put these clothes in there and then they'd have a, a little room, kind of like a microwave oven, and you put the can of Zyklon in there, close the door, and seal the door, and then there's a crank on there, you can open the can, and then heat it up, and that makes the gas come out of the can much easier, and a fan blows it into this little room, and it kills, kills all the lice on the clothes that way. And then you... Um, evacuate the gas up a long big chimney so uh, that takes maybe a long time to do that but it doesn't necessarily take a long time to kill people but you wouldn't if you were going to kill people you wouldn't use something like that because what well, you'd use an apparatus like that but they don't say that they said they just knocked them down a chimney in a hole in the roof and you know it got all over these people and everything like that and then they dragged them out wearing rubber gloves and stuff like that but and they'd also have to be wearing gas masks. And if those gas masks came out, and, you know, I mean, it, it, and not only that, but it's flammable, this gas. And it, you know, they could have sent off a flame. So it's not practical to exterminate people with this Zyklon B. The Nazis would have used something else. And I once sponsored a contest where I was going to um, w award somebody some money to come up with a better, safer way of, of killing people and I don't remember I think I don't know if it was my idea or somebody else's but the idea would be you know you get them on a railroad car and then back them into a, a siding where they had uh, water you know you could drown them all that way and and put them on a con and or else you could put them into a tunnel this is my idea you could put them in a tunnel and w then with the smoke from that locomotive you close the doors on the tunnel and that smoke would just asphyxiate everybody and all you'd have to do is you know the engineer would have a gas mask on and leave them in there for a while and that kind of a thing you know they could have done it that way and then also they're saying that they allegedly used um, diesel exhaust to kill people at um, a concentration camp called Treblinka but like I've got this book here it's called Dissecting the Holocaust and it's available on the internet and, and there's a good chapter in here that that goes into the diesel exhaust and um, what, how it's not practical to use for exterminating people. It doesn't have that much carbon monoxide in it compared to a, a automobile engine. And so like they use these diesel engines in mines because it's safe. So, they, um, so that's another way you can find out that this wasn't true. And I found out about this kind of like a kind of a coincidence. I heard this man that I knew talk about it. He was a school preacher named uh, Jed Smock and his pretty wife. And um, I heard him, he used to be a professor of history up in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. And he was talking about this in, Car in uh, Champaign, Illinois. I just happened to see him there, you know, and I knew him from Arizona. And uh, he was, people in the audience were ridiculing him for being a Holocaust denier. And I just, uh, so the next time I got near a library, I checked out this book called The Hoax of the 20th Century. And, uh, whoops, no, here you go. Anyway, ah, uh-oh. 
There it is, The Hoax of the 20th Century. And this is a really good book by a professor at the University of Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Anyway, my name is Raquel Order. Buy or sell, you have to have the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. Bye.